Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Christensen. This is Horror 101 with Dr. AC, a gathering place for fellow fiends the world over to discuss all things freaky and frightening. If you want to be part of the conversation, and I hope you do, I invite you to like this video, subscribe to the channel, maybe go back and check out some of our previous episodes, leave a comment, and most importantly, let us know the fright flicks you'd like to discuss in the future. That kind of connection is exactly what we're looking for, and it really does make a difference. We're all about sharing the scare, and we want to hear from you. When Phantasm premiered in early 1979, it was unlike anything horror fans had seen before. It was a coming-of-age tale that also dealt with death, loss, and abandonment. It had science fiction elements, villainous morticians, bizarre magic, and gory set pieces, all centering around a mysterious estate and an evil, if convoluted, plot to steal and enslave the dead, with terrific special effects on a minimal budget. The film was a huge hit in theaters and found an even wider fan base on television and home video, ultimately leading to four sequels and a labyrinthian mythology surrounding the tall man and his army of brain-sucking chrome spheres. Tonight, we celebrate 45 years of Phantasm and its creators, a tight-knit group who, over the course of five films, have reflected our world back to us through a crazy funhouse mirror, where four-barreled shotguns and 1971 hemikudas are your best friends, right alongside your best friends. I am very excited to chat about the tall man and lots and lots of spheres with my awesome panel. Let's bring everybody in and let's say hello to John Bowen of Rue Morgue Magazine. Good evening. S.A. Bradley of Hellbent for Horror. Hi, thanks for having me. Matthew Amador of Chicago, Illinois. So glad to be here, boy. And my blood brother beaming in from Lewisburg, West Virginia, Eric Fritches. This is the sound of my voice. And here we are. We are going to be chatting about this awesome franchise that's franchised with a PH Phantasm, starting way back in 1979, celebrating its 45th anniversary, followed by Phantasm 2, Phantasm 3, Lord of the Dead, Phantasm 4, Oblivion, and Phantasm 5, Ravager. And we are going to kick things off with Phantasm because we begin at the beginning. Uh, I would love to roll down to Eric. Can you tell us your first experience with Phantasm? Uh, an ad on the back of a comic book. Nice. Uh, Phantasm 2 uh, really blanketed the, the, the country's comic books uh, for Marvel and DC with their ads. And I had never heard of Phantasm um, it was before my time I was alive, but it was not something my dad would have wanted me to watch. And so when Phantasm 2 came out and I saw that ad, I was like, I don't know what this is, but I want to know more. I want to know what that ball is. I want to know what what's going on. And so uh, friends of mine and I went back and re and watched Phantasm on video. And then Phantasm 2 came out and we that's that began my love. Uh, Matthew. For me, it would be the art on the VHS boxes when I was renting when I was a kid. I was just fascinated by the look of them. Uh, it was at the time when VHS box art was was really at its at its pinnacle. You could see the the amazing artwork. There's like, oh, what is this in front of a, a you know a nightmare movie or a Friday Thirteenth movie or a Hellraiser movie? The silver spheres just I, it, 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 they fascinated me. Yeah, and then it just took off from there. Scott. I first saw something about Phantasm in Fangoria number two. Uh, that was where they had the splash page and they completely sold it to me because it said, stop, don't read anymore. You don't want to waste your time. You don't want to spoil this perfect film. And, you know, and they then go and tell you a whole bunch of stuff. And it was a huge article. And it was the first time that Fangori really had a gory thing. Like the first uh, episode issue was pretty much like Arabian Nights and Star Wars and stuff. And then they had this phantasm piece and a two page spread of a guy getting his head drilled. And I'm going, okay, I'm going to see if I can see this. But at the time I was a little bit young. Luckily for me, I know the exact day I saw it. <laughs> this is from uh, home box office back in the day. 
uh, on uh, October 26th, 1979. Uh, it was the first time that Phantasm showed. And that was the picture that I stole <laughs> out of the book. I was like, holy shit, I got to see this thing, especially because it said nudity, profanity, and graphic violence. And I was like, <laughs> we're right there. <laughs> and John, how about you? Unlike you guys, I had never heard of it before seeing it. Uh, I was with a bunch of friends at a drive-in, at the, the old Mustang drive-in in Kingston. A bunch of us just absolutely hopelessly fucking baked. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we went to see Halloween. How, uh, this was uh, after uh, Halloween had done its, its, its initial uh, run and was, was doing the grind houses and the drive-ins and whatnot. And uh, we, we were all uh, very hot and bothered to see Halloween, uh, which, of course, we all loved and uh, thought it was magnificent and everything. And then there was this other movie that none of us had ever heard of uh, on, on the bill. Basically, just, it was a case of everyone was too wasted to go home. Nobody wanted to face their parents. So we might as well stick around and watch this other movie. And nothing prepares you for phantasm. Halloween, as great as Halloween is, it does not prepare you for phantasm. Especially if all you know is that it's one it's one more horror movie. That's all any of us knew about it. And by by about a half hour in, we're all basically going, <laughs> did I just see that? Like, did that just happen? And uh, by the end of it all, I mean, we're all just, everybody's jaw was just in their lap. And uh, a, a few about a year later, when VCRs were just beginning to uh, proliferate and uh, it, uh, a bunch of us uh, had a had a place to ourselves for, for somebody's somebody's parents went away for the weekend, so we rented a VCR. And this was back when when even renting a VCR was right. was a big expensive prospect, mm -hmm. and they're all the size of a fucking Volkswagen. And so we we pooled all our money and met, like rented this machine, and we could afford maybe three movies. So we rented some porno and Phantasm and something else, and two friends who had been with me that night at the drive-in, and we made a point of okay. We're going to watch this this afternoon completely straight just to see if this if this is anywhere nearly as as mind roasting as it was at that night of the drive-in and sure enough, i mean we we drew the curtains but that was basically about it and we watched it and went yeah it really is that good and that bizarre and that utterly disorienting when you cross that line from horror fan to horror nerd. Decades later, you're going to be on a podcast doing doing this. <laughs> That's when you, you have long since crossed that line. My experience was honestly, because I know I saw Halloween in the theater in 1978, mm -hmm. and I have no recollection of when I saw Phantasm, because I feel like there has never been a time when I haven't seen Phantasm. Like it just kind of like permeated my brain. I know I saw a television edit of it, which is insane because it still was like incredibly shocking and violent just in its TV version. But seeing it finally on VHS in all its glory and being like, whoa, like, you know, watching the, the sphere land into the, the caretaker's head and just drill and just flow and flow and flow. And you think, I did not see that on TV. I'm pretty confident they didn't run that on TV. It is a film that I continue to go back to and I am consistently knocked out by. I cannot believe the courage and just the risks that Coscarelli takes as a filmmaker, uh, just in terms of storytelling uh, using nightmare logic in a way that really works and doesn't feel like slipshod. It mm -hmm. feels intentional. And I think that's really in a fascinating and uh, elusive gift for filmmakers mm. to do something that, that doesn't feel like, I don't know how to put these together, so I'm just going to smash them together and be like, eh, it's a dream, you know, it's fine. Uh, John, you talked about being, you know, going from horror fan to horror nerd. I mean, you went so far as to write a book about <laughs> the, the Phantasm franchise. Yeah. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about that before we dive into the series? I crossed paths with Don a, a couple of times before that, uh, just working for, for Rue Morgue. Um, I'd interviewed him about a couple of other things. Maybe the first was about a, a reissue of Phantasm or something. Uh, he came to Toronto when uh, Bubba Hotep was playing at, uh, at the film festival. 
uh, met him then, and then uh, we did a oh yeah, we did a, like a phantasm retrospective. So I mean, we we sort of developed a bit of a rapport. You know, I mean, he's he's this very very personable guy. A few years later, he was coming back to uh, yeah back for TIFF again for the festival uh, with uh, John Dies at the end. And mm -hmm. actually, I spent my my fiftieth birthday covering John Dies at the end at, at the, the film festival. <laughs> that was pretty pretty apt. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I contacted him beforehand because I was I was uh, I was already sort of online to to interview him for that anyway, and just said, look, I've got this this idea. And at this point, uh, Room Org had their own book imprint, and I bounced the idea off him. And he, he was he was interested. He said, let's let's get together, talk about it. Uh, you know, when I'm next. So, so we went out for for lunch and drinks and whatnot, and we kept on having one one thing after another, and it, and it, it just turned into this. Yes, we're both interested in doing this, but but we got to postpone it. So it, it, it with another couple of years, finally we just we both had just our, our schedules finally uh, came in a line, and and uh, which was great because he wound up being a, a real collaborator. I mean, I was I was grateful enough just to have a have him available to interview, but he he really uh, just got me in touch with a whole bunch of other people that that would have been you know not not necessarily because they're big names, but just that. Uh, kind of for the opposite reason, because they're not big names. They're not that easy to get hold of through publicists or or, or management or anything like that. Uh, people who had you know been been crew on on uh, various different films in the series, and and then of course the, all the cast members as well. So uh, so he was he really was a, a, a collaborator on it as as well as the interview subject. So that was that was really uh, you know I really couldn't have asked for better that way. Well, thank you, and and thank you for finally making that uh, a book a reality. It's pretty extraordinary. Oh, thanks. That's good to hear. Let us dive into Phantasm 1979, celebrating its 45th anniversary. Uh, we talked about our initial impressions of it. As you look at this film, it has so many layers to it. You know, it's a lot about loss. It's a lot about being a kid. And I feel like it captures that so well. I know Coscarelli had done, you know, a couple of previous films, uh, Kenny and Company is one that people point to as being so kind of succinctly capturing, you know, being a kid. Mm -hmm. And I think that really plays through. And Michael Baldwin appeared in that film and he plays Mike in this film as well. When you first think about the first Phantasm, like what are some things that come up for you? One of the things that I think is really connective for me is that there's a piece of uh, Phantasm that talks to a group of people that normally isn't in films. It's a very working class kind of movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, from the other side of tracks kind of folks. Like I knew everybody that was in there, the motorhead, people working on their cars. Uh, these are normally people who would be in another movie. They'd be on like the bleachers while the people in the foreground are the ones being interviewed. Uh, we just had this, there was a camaraderie that I felt uh, by being seen. So people who had guns, you know, obviously they're hunters. The family's probably hunters. Uh, emancipated kids. Two of my friends from high school were emancipated over the death of a family member. And so that they were in a house alone. Uh, so there were a lot of things that really felt real. Uh, and the idea of how the brothers were is certainly something that people do connect to a lot. But I think that there's something very grassroots in the way that phantasm talks about uh an america that you don't necessarily always see and especially at that time uh, i think uh, we were uh, seeing more of uh you know even in in uh halloween they're suburban kids right uh this is a little bit less than suburbia this is like somewhere out in the boonies a little bit more uh and so i really did connect with that uh, and I told that uh, Coscarelli when I when I talked to him and I said, you know, it's interesting. It takes a bit to be a Phantasm fan. You take some you take some punches from a regular horror fans. He's like, oh, I know they just don't get what's going on. You know, why do these people act like they do? You know, the, the main character is an ice cream salesman. <laughs> they sit on a porch and drink beers. You know, uh, it, it's it's got a very strange feel to it. But it's once you get uh, into having something so seemingly normal and all of a sudden you're transported into this strange world where everything is like not even making uh, linear sense. And I think that that's one of the things that really captured me early on was that there was this moment of pause that felt somewhat European 
Uh, I, I feel that there's a very European film style to some of the things that are done there that don't feel like your straight up uh, uh, American horror movie, especially at that time. So it's the idea of being able to connect with the characters in a way that feels very, very familiar. Uh, and then having this total unfamiliarity of like little dwarves running around and stuff. It takes place in and around a mortuary. And we have a tall man played by Angus Scrim, who's kind of the... I don't know. Like he doesn't. He's the his role evolves at that at that mortuary. Like he starts out maybe just running the mortuary, but then you know, as is, you know, ever have a boss that just gives you one extra task and one extra task, and then your job is <laughs> completely different. Eventually, you're just you know uh, making mini me size slaves out of corpses to go do slave labor on a red planet. It, it, you know, I mean, if I had it, a just it happens to us it. all, right? <laughs> Two things. One is the style of filmmaking. I think absolutely there's some European style that I see uh, as it's edited together, where uh, dialogue will become voiceover narration as it segues over a scene that doesn't have anything to the, the car driving away, but you still hear, hear the voice kind of happening. It's very, very dreamlike. I think it's fantastic. I think they are very skillful and lucky, and I don't think luck is a bad thing. I think sometimes you can take things that are done on the cheap, that are done almost in an amateur fashion, and sometimes it gets put together and it's skin a rink, which is not my right. favorite favorite piece. But you get that. Or you can get this, which just ends up being so layered and so many more questions can be asked about it. I make uh, my living as a psychotherapist. I do a lot of speaking to people about their dreams. And one way that we look into dreams is just in terms of representation. What is what? What do you see here? I, I love that this movie has uh, tall things, small things, things in the dark, things that were uh -huh. that, that, that we're afraid of. These contrasting elements that we're afraid of. We're afraid of of saying goodbye to people. We're afraid of grief. We're afraid of sex. I love that each of the scenes with the lady in lavender, where she is supposedly having sex with these men. It's as if it's made by someone who does not know what sex is. <laughs> From 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 the point of view of, of of this of this young boy, it reminds me. There's an episode of American Gods where they had staged it for mm -hmm. two men to be having sex, and uh, they showed it to Brian Fuller, the showrunner actor, and he's like, "Hey, what do you think? Is this great?" And he was like, "How is that? <laughs> Does he have a candy cane shaped penis? How is this working? <laughs> this is not. This does not work." And that reminds me of the Lady in Lavender. She's having sex somehow, and it's great a couple times, but it's not. Nothing's really moving. I I, I love that. I love these little moments which may have just lucked out and can be read into it this way but it's given us a a, a film with 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 layers that we can read into that i think i think that's fantastic thank you matthew that was a great read thank you eric how about you phantasm really pushed all my buttons because it is all about these massive big ideas and equal sized ambiguity mm. you don't know what anything is you just see these amazing images and what could that possibly mean? You know, what what's in the room that you hear the vibration from? What did that the 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 crazy psychic lady's granddaughter see when she opened the door and screamed? You, I mean, it just hangs in your head through most of the movie until you start seeing things that uh, they start revealing what's in the room. They start revealing various things, but you you can never quite pin it down. It's always elusive. It's mercurial, even. Even things like the, the the crazy old psychic lady, who was maybe my favorite character in the whole series. <laughs> um, I, I just adored that whole scene. And it seemed like it wanted to go somewhere. And then it just doesn't. It just it's it's a big question mark. And yeah. you you kind of get hints at it later on in the series, which I'm I'm sure we'll get around to, but uh <laughs> Just that level of ambiguity really struck a chord with me. It may, be, it may have been the first time I was exposed to that kind of storytelling. For me, you know, like the performances are also mm -hmm. really key to this movie. I mean, Angus Scrim, first off, that name is so great. And the fact that, <laughs> yeah. the fact that he didn't come up with it for this, he came up with it, you know, back in his like high school or college days when you weren't supposed to be performing off campus. And so he mm -hmm. came up with Angus Scrim and then borrowed it back for this film. I love his, just his presence in this film where he's asked to do very little, 
everything is used with such economy. And by contrast, we have so much going on with Michael Baldwin that just very, and, and I love that he's our hero and he's scared the whole movie. Yeah. And he continues to push forward and do things and challenge himself, but he is not happy about any of this. He doesn't like he doesn't like his real life and he also doesn't like this kind of like weird surreal life that he stumbled into. Going back to the point Scott raised about about uh, the familiar and the unfamiliar in the characterizations, that's something that also jumped out for me in the style of horror or even though it was it was quite unlike anything I'd seen because it does have I mean just in terms of the plot it's it's absolutely unlike anything any of us saw before, yeah, um, right. you know, I mean, Don, Don mentions, you know, that uh, Invaders from Mars was sort of an influence on it. And Phantasm was sort of his backup plan when he couldn't get the rights to something wicked this way comes. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah, there's certain there elements of that, but you know, just in, in terms of plotting, it's completely unlike any horror movie you've, you've seen. And yet the feel of it, so much of it is, is very familiar. It's so, it's so very Gothic. Even though we didn't really see that many that many horror films set in in mortuary before, but just be, with all the death imagery around, it has this very uh, almost kind of traditional, almost old school feel. And Angus Scrim also was part of that as well, because it draws on a lot of, of the old Universal classics, and yet he's completely unlike uh, right. anything that came before. You know, he's in this very sober-looking suit and everything, which you know, of course, con conjures all kinds of, of baddies from from back back in the '30s, even. And yet, uh, is is completely what this time traveling dimension jumping? What now? <laughs> it's that 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 combination of the familiar and unfamiliar that that I found just incredibly charming. And I and I thought it was interesting. You you brought that up about the characters. That's something that Gosh really brings to a lot of of his uh, yeah work. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting that uh, I think um, you mentioned the the clothing and stuff. One of the things that I always thought about with. Uh, phantasm is that it's a movie that for its cost it had a very cool reserved kind of color palette mm -hmm. uh it had a very uh formalized kind of look i mean the first time we see jody and everybody they're in suits mm -hmm. sure they're in the 70s but there's nothing that's really overly garish outside of maybe some of the bell bottoms but mm -hmm. the uh the idea of uh, even the inside of the mortuary uh, uh, you have this marble, which we know is contact paper. So yes. there's the same pattern. But the idea of these patterns that are there uh, and the uh, the lighting is always like a little bit above and behind. So it's a little shadowy everywhere. There's a huge contrast between the lighting in this one and two, mm. uh, because this one really has this feel that it, it it has a almost, I wouldn't say timeless, but it has that feeling of like, well, this feels like everybody's a little bit more professional than they really are. Uh, and there's something about how Angus Scrim holds himself, comportment. You know, he doesn't have to do a lot. It's not, say, at the grandeur of, say, when we see Darth Vader for the first time. But there's a level of foreboding oh, yeah. about everything that he does, including a slow motion walk, which is one of the great, great moments inside of the movie. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think about all those things. It's very fairy tale like. And where how many times, especially through the entire series, are people in front of a fireplace surrounded by candles? There's this whole tell me a story thing that feels a little bit like a fairy tale and then it's also happening on the outskirts of town so it's really cool well scott you just mentioned uh the the mausoleum and the fact that that's contact paper it's a set and that you if you had told me that i would not have believed you i was like yeah. like you built that that mausoleum and all and the marble it like you said is is contact paper it's just a pattern. It's a wallpaper pattern that gets stuck up on the set. You know, Coscarelli was really innovative in wanting to be able to control what he could. Like he knew that the mausoleum was going to be a major, a major setting. And he just makes the most of it by making it seem otherworldly. Yeah. Like everything else is, is pretty much found locations. Mm -hmm. And then there's this place that is unlike any other place. As Matthew mentioned, Lucky, uh, they had people build that that were like theater. Uh, I think they were actually in construction. Yeah. So they spent extra money and they built this thing that you could stand on. Right. So because of that, uh, they're able to use it a bunch 
and they had that weird construction so you could make it seem like it was endless. That's like really, the ro rotundas. Yeah. yeah. Matthew? John, you were, Scott had mentioned how there's a reserved quality. Scott, I believe you had that it's, it's, there's a reserved quality to the filmmaking and how they're setting up these shots. Having that reserved vibe allows them then to take this otherworldly experience and then dial it up to 11. <laughs> uh, literally take it otherworldly. Because I think if you look up, I'm not sure, but if you look it up on IMDb, it might be categorized as horror science fiction and cuckoo bananas i think those are the three categories that this fits into uh i don't want to leap forward too quickly into phantasm 2 but scott you did mention that there's a different there's a very different feel between phantasm and phantasm 2 after coscarelli <laughs> finishes phantasm and it's a pretty successful but not a huge blockbuster you know, it, it kind of becomes an instant cult favorite people find on video. Then he goes and does Beastmaster, which is another one that becomes a cult hit on like cable. Universal comes calling and says, hey, you know, what would you think about doing a sequel to Phantasm? And it feels a little more I, I, commercial. I, I feel like he's got more money. It feels like the lighting scheme is different. It feels like he has more resources available to him. And like many filmmakers, many independent filmmakers, he does better, I think, with less. Yeah, you couldn't say that. Uh, that I'm completely in agreement. Rewatching two, I realized, I remembered that I wasn't a big fan of it. I was waiting for it in the theaters and stuff like that. And uh, it doesn't feel like him, first off. I think there's, there's a part of this where, and there's even a joke about Sam Raimi in it. Mm -hmm. It feels yeah. like he saw Evil Dead 2 and was like, this is the future. This is where I should be going. Mm. And, and so it really, uh, there's parts of it that I really like, but uh, the uh, oversaturation of light that was very big in the 80s, that blue light for outside at night, uh, was really starting to drive me a little bit crazy. Uh, the complication of the story, and I've got to tell you, I'm going to be like Roman here. I cannot, <laughs> but I must. I'm going to be, uh, I love Phantasm so much. It's one of the top 10 movies, and yet one of the biggest titty twists for me is this franchise mm. because I love it so much in some areas and in other places I'm like oh and this is everything that I don't like about sequels mm -hmm. it's telling me way too much I don't need to know more about the tall man I don't need to know more about this world uh, and the second one gives me some stuff that's really cool but it also does a little bit too much description for me adds new features that are kind of like such sequelitis <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and so there, I watch it again and I will watch it again and again and again, but it's the one that I go, uh, James Legro, man, <laughs> poor guy. <laughs> well, it's funny. Uh, yeah. James Legro is kind of indicative because he is a more macho overtly masculine Mike. And I feel like the movie is a more overtly masculine type of movie. I think there's a real sensitivity to the first one that is lacking in the sequel. And and like you, I went to the theater in 1989. I was I was super psyched, and I I couldn't put my finger on it then. I was like, I I don't know why this isn't filling me with joy. But I immediately went home and watched my VHS copy of Phantasm again and went, okay, now I'm all right. They had much better sets in terms of the mausoleums, mm -hmm. um, and. I believe I just finished John's book last night, but John may be able to speak to this, but I, I think did, were those all built or did they have some that they found? Uh, they, they were all built. Okay. Um, so they spent a lot of money on the interiors, not so much on the exteriors. <laughs> if you, the, the famous scene of them walking through the graveyard and you see all the, the empty holes where the tall man's minions have dug up yeah. the bodies. And then there's like this tiny shack in the distance and they go into this tiny tin roof shack, and suddenly it's this massive multi floor <laughs> double double level basement. <laughs> and I just kept thinking, this guy's part Time Lord or something. Right. Yeah. Well, right. And, and, and you can't say that he's not. To yeah, be that's fair, true. there's a point in a lot of franchises, usually when they get to a, a few movies in, where they're no longer creating the trends, they're chasing after them. Yes. And that's what I feel like uh, part two kind of, I feel like it does dip into. Sure, there were influences from other media in, in the first Phantasm. I mean, the, the box, the Dune box, you know, right out of right. Dune, that's great. 
Right. You fold it in and it works. This one just feels like the shadow of Evil Dead looms so large. Yeah. In terms of the humor, it does, it, it leans very heavy into the humor. And again, owing that to, uh, to Evil Dead 2, to the point that I always think of Phantasm 2, and I've seen it, <laughs> I've seen it more times <laughs> than, a, than a person who usually doesn't like a movie has seen a movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I yeah. always consider yeah. it, I consider it Phantasm 2, a movie for boys. Mm. It has mm. dick jokes. Mm. It has yeah. sex jokes. I just feel like it be, it becomes a little more juvenile. And yes, it over explains things. There's oh, it, it owes it owes to um to Dream Warriors. It yeah. owes to there's a lot of things being brought in, and it makes me a little bit bummed out because I saw the first one as being almost like an auteur picture, and now yes. seeing this one owing to other ones, I'm like, well, I get it. They're your friends. Get new info get new um, uh, influences to help motivate you and, and, and create new things. It just didn't, it doesn't quite stick the landing for me, even though it is so much more money, so much glossier and tries to be much more of a linear narrative. And I think that's what it is right there. Now that I say it mm -hmm. out loud, it's so yeah. much more of a linear narrative that I think I can feel how many cooks are in the kitchen with mm. this one. You know, kind of uh, going along with the sequel, I just, it bumps up, it amps up the spheres. Right. And if we go back to the first one, we talk about, like kind of the simplicity of that sphere and how they were able to manage those effects on with no money at all. You know, it's on fishing line. It's, it's people throwing it, you yeah. know, and yet there's such elegance to it. And the fact that it's never explained, like yes. what is this flying Chrome sphere that haunts the halls? We don't know. Like it just is part of the mythology that we don't understand. And, and then to go, <laughs> to go supersize me with the, the sequel, yeah. you're like, Oh, there's a gold one. And it has, it has buzz saws and things like that. And you're like, Oh shoot. Yeah. And, buzz saws and lasers. And it can blow you up except for when it doesn't want to. And it has a heat seeking thing. It feels vaguely to me like when you have a Dungeons and Dragons game and someone is creating an item without the oversight <laughs> of a DM. <laughs> <laughs> the spheres can have, any tool R2-D2 possesses. Right. <laughs> there is definitely a Star Wars-y thing that they can't get away from. The first one may or may not have been by mistake. You know, uh, I mean, the, the, the timeline. Yeah, the jaw was. It never made great sense to me, the timeline thing, because uh, Star Wars is out by 77. Even if it took two years for right. him to make this movie, he still may have heard of this movie, right? <laughs> uh, and, and there are moments uh, through all of the films where there is a little bit of a lean into Star Wars, uh, mm. especially uh, in four, you know, when he's out in the Death Valley and you're basically on things where R2-D2 rolled, right? Yep. <laughs> you're like yep. right yep. in the caverns. But I think the thing that hits me about the sequelitis is that this is kind of like, and it, it breaks my heart sometimes to think about it because I love Phantasm so much, but it is something where I think he knuckles into trying to give the fans exactly what he thinks they want mm. because it's very much like the Star Trek uh, phenomenon where they can't make the Star Trek movies anymore because it would be an hour and a half of the business that every character needs to do and then five minutes of plot. So they all ended up being mad scientists with a rocket at some planet. And it kind of happens with this as well. Oh, there's the window breaking. There's the fire. There's the exploding car. There's the exploding house. Uh, and it does feel uh, really uh, when we start getting into the, like the dick jokes that we talk about here in two, there's this shift away from the importance of Michael mm -hmm. and more into mm -hmm. this importance of the guy that fans like. He's mm. an easier sell, you know, Reggie. And maybe it's because we're all getting older, too. And they, he thought, oh, well, let's go with the middle aged guy now. But there is a shift in in the heart as we get further in with Reggie, which has a great payoff. We'll get to that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Because then when we go into three, I mean, it's absolutely Reggie's story. Even though Michael Baldwin comes back, it, it has become the folk. Reggie has become the focus. But also in three, I liked Reggie less because he becomes <laughs> such a lech. Yeah, I'm, like, a where, dog. I'm like, where did this guy come from? It's it's funny. I I uh, I'm actually the opposite way about two. I'm I'm very fond of two, but a lot of the uh, the problems that that uh, that you guys bring up 
are the ones that I have with three. For, for me, two is is in a lot of ways. Uh, I think I think it's actually the strongest in the series, and in, in some respects, not all. Hmm. But but uh, the the things that the the concerns that you're raising, I I think are a lot of the concerns that I have about three. I absolutely love the first Evil Dead and hated the sequels. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the original Elm Street, hated the sequels. All mm -hmm. Phantasm doesn't fall prey to a lot of, of the pitfalls that they do. But uh, when we hit part three, that's uh, that's where I, I start I start sharing the concerns um, about it. I, three for me is, is just uh, it became way too jokey. Well, we talked off camera about kind of continuity. And mm -hmm. we start having like some real continuity issues. Uh, yeah. You know, we have like our four barreled shotgun that shows up in two, which is, you know, it's cool. It's fun. But we see him throw it away. Yeah. And then suddenly, you know, ba -bing, it shows back up in three because, hey, that was cool. We, sh we should have that back again. Mm -hmm. And as we've moved forward in the series, things have become less dreamlike. Mm -hmm. and have become more linear, have become more kind of grounded, even though weird shit still happens. Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, it hit me more about how it was just kind of, uh, by three, it's more like zombies, but mm -hmm. it's uh, like a refurbishing of zombies. It's interesting because for me, three felt like it was going back in tone for a while there. And then about the hour mark, it does lose the fucking thread for about 20 minutes and becomes comedic. Mm -hmm. But it ends with that sort of dread that I remember from the first one that was somewhat missing for me in two. Mm -hmm. And in the very beginning, uh, uh, when they uh, when they first get to, he meets the kid. Tim is Tim, his name. Tim, that's it, Tim. It reminded me of another thing that's in the, uh, the, the movies is the ingenuity usually mm -hmm. the ingenuity of children, uh, like the young boy. Yeah. So he has all this stuff. I mean, it's insane. He's like Jigsaw in this movie. He's got so much happening, this one kid. But uh, I, that's always one of the things that I loved about the Phantasm series is that there's uh, a solid stateness to how things are made. You know, I'm going to make a blowtorch that's going, and I'm going to use it to, to start the fire in the fireplace at one point. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, frisbees, you know, with razor blades on them may, may not be as good, but it's still, <laughs> there's this ingenuity that's going on through the series. And it's usually, you know, things that you might have in your garage, a welder's mask and a shotgun and you, and you go out there and have that. Uh, it gets a little bit big, uh, in some of the movies, but I felt this thing watching three again, which I kind of dismissed for years. And I was like, I like the feel of it up until they're out. I think camping with Rocky and all of a sudden it's like, okay, now we need to have the finger severing turning into a bug. Now we need to have, and that's where I really started to feel that pattern showing up. Let's talk about Rocky. Cause she's kind of like the first major introduction of a, a new character, Yeah, you know, like, and uh, I, I don't know if she's a fan favorite or not, uh, but she's certainly significant in the franchise. This is where I go. Reggie, why are you hitting on the lesbian who's clearly a lesbian? Suddenly, I didn't like Reggie nearly as much as I used to like Reggie. This is where I start to feel a little bad for the character and the actress. She's put into a place where she can uh, be strong. She can say no. She can find a way to craftily get out of a situation. And then immediately after, we see a dream sequence where she's having sex with Reggie. Yeah. So yep. even though... You've, you've built her up to this, and then it's kind of, it undercuts it a bit. Yes, it's played for comedic effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the introduction of a female character. Yes. Um, and a female character who uh, was obviously, I mean, you can tell right from the beginning, okay, she's she's not a damsel, okay? Right, right. She, she's going to be saving their asses rather than the other way around. Uh, although, I mean, it's, it, that's a kind of a, a traditional thing in fandom. I mean, everybody winds up saving everybody else at least once. I thought, hey, that that's great as well. But I feel I feel bad saying, but the, the writing of, of her character is oh, great. So oh, phew. Good. yeah. I mean, good God, like, a, oh, well, we we need to make her an urban an urban black chick, and okay, so let's trot out every possible urban black chick cliche. You know, it, it just seems assembled from from parts. It, she was just way too stock. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and that, 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 that kind of bothered me. Uh, I thought of a way to fix her. Let me back up to Phantasm 1. The single most scary scene that just <laughs> scary happens at the 59-minute mark 
when the African American lady who we've never yeah. seen before, never heard referred to, appears right. out of nowhere. I called her Mrs. Jump Scare. She's, <laughs> I guess, their housekeeper. Myrtle, <laughs> right. Scares the hell out of Reggie and then disappears, never to be seen again. Yep. So then that house gets blown up. I assume she was still in it. And so I kept <laughs> waiting for the reveal where Rocky was like her granddaughter and oh. was coming back to get revenge on the tall man. That would have made this so much better. Yeah. I think the things, it's so smart that everybody's talking about how the writing really uh, is, is wonky at this point. He brings in this great character. Uh, but uh, where it really worked for me and why I think the very beginning of that movie was uh, kind of a step up for me is that it kind of goes on that Americana thing again. Yeah, we're, we're uh, in the background. There's always this whisper of like there's a weird apocalyptic thing happening in part of America that everyone has forgotten. Right. This is somewhere in Oregon yeah. and these towns are disappearing. And so there's like this motif of going down towns where they're just boxed in and everything. And you have this moment, which is a little bit like um, Night of the Hunter, where there's this woman that has all these kids at this house. And there are mm -hmm. all these kids that have left these towns that are just laid to waste. And as far as the rest of America knows, this isn't happening. So there's a really interesting Americana feel. There's definitely a thing with the little kid, Tim, where he's hardened by his family dying. His dad's a sheriff and all this stuff. And his dialogue is actually pretty good when he's first meeting. Mm -hmm. I really felt this road picture feel in the very beginning that I thought was really, really strong until it just kind of derails itself for some weird reason and then kind of grabs itself back uh right around that the probably the last great car crash mm. right last great car stunt oh and, good god that's incredible yeah well yeah. that that pink hearse you know yeah. yeah which 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 again i was just gonna say we we should talk about like our our three baddies who are you know become like the <laughs> the the henchmen for the tall man mm -hmm. they just kind of come out of nowhere and again, they're kind of jokey and they feel very like Return of the Living Dead. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they're there for comedic effect. Uh, but yes, that car stunt is pretty incredible. And, and Coscarelli talks in his autobiography about mm -hmm. that stunt and about how, you know, the guy, the, the stunt man is unconscious from hitting the ramp. Uh, Coscarelli has closed his eyes because of the noise from hitting the ramp and is, is doing the pan with his eyes closed. And yet it's a, it's an incredible moment in, in the film. What you were saying about the ingenuity of the kids and comparing Tim to Michael from the first one. And I think this is kind of the cutesiness of Tim. It goes along with the cutesiness of taping razor blades to a Frisbee, <laughs> right. as opposed to Michael who sits there with a shotgun shell and then thinks, okay, how can I get out of this room? And we watch him like put something on the firing yeah. tab and then tape to a hammer. And I mean, again, that probably wouldn't work. Don't try this at home, <laughs> but, but it, we buy into it and it, it comes from a place of intelligence and desperation yeah. as opposed to just like here, this is the way I defend myself with my fancy flying, you know, yeah, but there's a believability. And that's something that goes back and forth with Coscarelli. I really love uh, him and even uh, uh, Wes Craven in Nightmare on Elm Street and a few other films. There's this moment where, what do I have in front of me? I need to defend myself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in the second one, uh, there's the uh, hand grenade in the beer can. A cut and <laughs> half beer can. And I, I had to say, God yep. damn, that's yep. pretty good. Yep. I like yep. that. Uh, I, I thought it was really cool on how they were trying to make sure if somebody came in, they would really get a, an interesting welcome. Yeah. The, the slipping of the string around the doorknob with the shotgun. Yeah. Uh, those are things that always, it kind of fits in with what I was talking about before with uh, they have guns on the walls. And there's that whole thing of like the, the brother saying, you never point a gun at someone unless you're going to shoot them. And yeah. you make sure you kill them if you're going to shoot them. That's something I heard as a kid. It's that kind of John Wayne kind of logic that's out there. But because you have that kind of foundation. You have this idea of people who are going to have to build something themselves. They're going to have to, the government's not going to come. Nobody's going to come and help you from the tall man. We're going to have to do this ourselves. And so we're on the other side of the tracks. Who's got the the grease gun? You know, who's got who's got the flamethrower? Okay, 
put it together. Yeah, so I think, but you're right, Michael, much more, There's he's not precocious as, as much. Yeah. You know, and I think it's what you mentioned early on, which is very adept and astute, that he's constantly afraid. Uh, he's lost things. He's afraid of what he's going to lose. He's afraid he's not going to have anybody with him later. There's that loneliness. Family's gone. We look ahead to Phantasm Four, where we get the most explaining. And well, I remember watching Phantasm Four: Oblivion for the first time and thinking at least Coscarelli is not making the same movie over and over and over again. I remember watching that and going. I don't even know what this mythology is at this point. Mm -hmm. Like Jebediah Morningside and he's the doppelganger for the tall man and he went through a portal and he came back. Uh, again, I, I applaud Coscarelli for doing something different. Mm -hmm. But as you said early on, it's very similar to the explaining of Freddy and mm -hmm. the demystifying yeah. And it, it makes it less of a nightmare and more of like an adventure tale. I kind of dug the uh, Jebediah morning side. And it, it seemed like to me that when Phantasm ex takes the time to actually try to answer something, it almost always seems disappointing at first. Like Phantasm 3, we learned there are brains in the brains sphere. In the ball, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's that's so disappointing. That's <laughs> where do they keep all their R2D2 tools? <laughs> but then you get the transition. We learned why he did that because we bring Jody back as a ball. And I thought that was brilliant. Mm, I mm. loved the Jody ball character who could be a ball one moment, transform, whether that's a mental projection or what have you, we don't know the evolution continues and Jebediah Morningside gave us just enough of a hint at a past without truly explaining a whole lot. Mm. And they also brought back crazy blind psychic lady mm -hmm. um, from the first movie and said nothing about her origins. So you're <laughs> left with more ambiguity. I, I adored that part. Yeah, and we can see him just stretch his acting skills too. Cause that's true. Jebediah is a very different character. Yeah, if only my balls had brains, my, my life would have been very, <laughs> very differently. But I, I, I know what you're, what you're to uh, take off from from your point there, Eric. Uh, actually, there, yeah, there there is a, there is a certain letdown to things getting explained, and yet um, when you consider how you know how many how many entries there are in this in this franchise and everything, comparatively little actually gets explained. Like right. if you go from one to five, they uh, you know, and some and granted, some of the, some of the explanations we get are pretty unsatisfying. You know, some of them are just cheesy. Some of them are just uh, just don't work. But um, but but if you compare it to it to other, like especially Elm Street, um, when you look at that, just over the arc of five Phantasm movies, there isn't really that much of it. I find it interesting, Aaron, that you mentioned that he doesn't make the same movie twice, considering that this movie. Part four is about 40% footage from a right. previous movie <laughs> <laughs> that's been spliced into it. Four, I, okay, I admire four. Mm -hmm. I, it, to me, it feels, yeah, I admire it. It's not a movie mm -hmm. that I'm going to put on when I'm feeling like I need, you know, a pick me up. It feels mm -hmm. to me a little like actually Lynchian in like a Twin Peaks The Return kind of way, where mm -hmm. it's kind of almost like a, we're going to add some new lore and we're going to kind of expand push it a little bit further but we're still staying very dreamlike there's some dialogue that happens in the present that is then played as being in the background of some of the old footage that's that's mm -hmm. that's edited in what is real what is not this is a part where this movie i say i admire it because this is where i absolutely feel like it recovers from sequelitis in mm -hmm. the sense that so many times uh franchises will end up being there for cash grabs they'll just go for it's when it becomes too jokey it's or just loses its focus. It's 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 its original mission statement. Hellraiser becomes a slasher with part three mm -hmm. and and jokey. Uh, we have Freddy Krueger in the on the beach in the daylight at one point. Like the, yeah. these things just morph. And here by part four, this is not a cash grab. This is very dreamlike. This is getting back to the original feel for me of the mm -hmm. original Phantasm. Even if I appreciate the original Phantasm more. I see this sensibility kind of returning to there. And also it, it, it's, it's, it remains, <laughs> it gives you so much more info, but what do you do with it? What? So, okay. <laughs> so I guess he's telekinetic. Sure. <laughs> yes. Jawas yeah. in the, in death Valley. All right. 
cool. You right. can make your own right. spheres. Work, mm. work, girl, oh, work. Mud all. <laughs> also, I don't know about you guys, but you know, given that 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 four in four in particular was you know the backup plan after the 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 uh, the big blowout uh, thing fell through, and, and then you know the and uh, and I. The blow up being Phantasm 1999, which yeah, was the, that was the film that was supposed to happen, and Roger Avery had written the screenplay right. for, and yes. nobody ended up um, yeah. going for um, it. But, go did, ahead, John. Did I, I know that was a that was a big crushing disappointment to everybody involved, but I got to tell you, there's a part of me that's really glad it didn't happen. I I I because I I'm thinking, good God, sequelitis. Uh, ostensibly, Don was going to be in charge of, of of where it went and everything. Um, I just I, I didn't like the sound of it. Like I, I I talked to Roger Avery about it for for that for the book there. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where do you guys stand on that? Uh, I I'm I'm like the worst horror fan in the world because I'm the one that doesn't really want a lot of sequels at all. Yeah. Uh, because I, my thought on horror is the less I know about everything, like the the original phantasm is like this great ice sculpture and it's yeah. just there for that moment and it's a brilliant and amazing and everything more that i get uh bothers me i, I would have thought that a big budget part of me was like finally everyone can fall in love with phantasm like mm -hmm. us weirdos that only know cult films would yeah. uh, but i also went it's probably going to get commercialized so in a way i think 1999 falling apart might might not have been the worst thing but you know, I have the same kind of feeling like Matthew has about four because parts of me are like, oh, this is the worst stuff. This is the stuff that I can't stand at all about sequels. The whole Jebediah thing uh, is like, wait, this takes everything that I believed in Phantasm 1 and basically crushes up in a little ball and tosses it to the side. You know, even telling me, I think in three, why they make the crunchy, the guys so crunchy and small is completely different than what I was told in Fangoria issue number <laughs> two, right? And so uh, it, it, those things drove me crazy. But at the same point, there is this wonderful stuff of seeing the old footage mixed in and he had to be imaginative and how he's going to mix it in. It also let, lets me look at the original phantasm a little bit differently. Yeah, like uh, there's this very fairy tale thing of boy, cut me down boy, mm -hmm. which feels like an Aesop's fable of some sort or, uh, you know, he's, yeah. he's up in the tree uh, and he's just sitting there waiting for the kid to come back. And these are things that weren't in the original. Right. Uh, I mean, it was very sleek. It was a shark in the water. And now you have these weird little pieces that come in. I think that there's something really cool and eerie about him driving a hearse out into Death Valley. And he's in there. With, I don't know where he gets the fucking candelabra or the candles. But at the same point, him with the candles there and outside are all these things on the windows. Yeah. That was very lynching. There's very lost highway kind of feel in that piece yeah and i'll tell you the one the one lynchy image that, that really seems that is 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 where he looks in the mirror and sees himself with that like stalking thing over his face. yeah my god that's the most most lynch thing in this entire series mm -hmm. yeah it goes between lynch and then there are moments where i'm like oh and jesus christ when's candace hillegas gonna show up because it's like <laughs> carnival of souls like somebody's running outside of the, <laughs> the yeah. vehicle but one of the things that made me sad was like uh, we talked about Jody kind of being the sh the sphere, is that it's not Jody anymore. Like yeah. we kind of lose Jody somewhere, and you know, like Reggie truly is Mike's only family, yeah. and you know, I was kind of I was saddened by that because because Reggie kind of has become the the star of the series, and there's that sense of they they absolutely rely on each other, but he's lost. He's lost Jody. And I was like, yeah. oh, that 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 hurt me in a way that I wasn't expecting when I watched it again this time. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, to have Jody betray you is the, the worst the worst thing you could do to us. But he is he is and is not Jody. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like these two things are both the, the, the thing, both both through at the same time. Also, I really hope if there is a heaven and I go to it, I do not continue aging. I hope that that just pauses <laughs> at some <Yeah>. point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Scott, you're, you're mentioning, yeah, all these different styles. There's also something really fantastic about having worked with this same ensemble of actors for, for oh, yeah. over, over a decade now yeah. that also gives a little Richard Linklater feel because now we see the exact same actors from, uh, God, at that point, it would have been 20 years before. Age, age 12 and 33 in the same yeah. movie. I mean, holy shit. Yeah. 
Yeah, which is really, really just an amazing, amazing way to just kind of, it's, it's a wonderful exercise, if nothing else. Yeah, that was the inspiration. He was like, well, what, how could I make a Phantasm sequel with no money? Okay, I have all of this footage. I've already got, you know, 10, 50% of the movie made. But, but again, I find this one to be, as you just said, Matthew, I find this to be an interesting experiment in the Phantasm universe. Yeah, it feels like I would have been happy if, as a special feature on a disc, right? All of that footage without yeah. having to have a, a major narrative going through it. Because I think that's one of the weird things about the movie is it drives me crazy in so many places with the things that I dislike about sequels. And yet I cannot pretend that I am not absolutely jazzed seeing additional footage from Phantasm. And like the whole thing of him, uh, I mean, they had to have that, cheesy uh, voiceover remember the day before it all happened <laughs> yeah but that whole idea that's so kenny and company right he gets on on the back of the ice cream truck yep. and it's going down the street and then and then the the idea that they're driving the challenger out of town and coming into town is the yeah. uh, is the hearse yeah. that was really cool and they didn't yeah. use it in the movie you know but you know seeing this stuff was well worth my time well, and I really like the ending, I got to say. I like the ending sure. where we have it echoed back, yeah. you know, just the wind. Because in watching the original Phantasm where Jody's like, eh, it's just the wind. And you're like, that is such an asinine thing to say. And for him yeah. to be echoing yeah. that at the end of, you know, what we think is the arc. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, wow. You know, the last thing that my, I remember one of the last things my brother said to me, you know. Yeah. 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 And also, I just, I just, I like the fact that, that's one real departure as well. If you look at all the other endings until then, I mean, the last fucking thing I wanted to see in, in the fourth one is in the last five seconds, the tall man jumps up again. Like, okay, right, right. We, you know, we, we had it, had it in the first one and it was kind of obligatory in the second one. And then the third, <laughs> it was kind of okay. But I, it's like, but I was, I was really thinking like all, all the way through, you know, please don't do this again. And instead it just kind of dissolves. It doesn't yeah. in so much as just dissolve. Yeah. And, and uh, in this, in this really sort of ambiguous fashion and uh, which normally I, that, that, that kind of thing strikes me as extremely lazy, but yeah, it yeah. Just works wonderfully there. I think uh, I, mm. I really, really liked it a lot. Well, and Scott, you mentioned, you know, Carnival of Souls, I feel like <laughs> Phantasm Five Ravager kind of is the Carnival of Souls of this yeah. movie because we get that sense of was it a dream? Was it right. not a dream? Was it just you know did this all come out of Reggie's imagination? Yeah, as we see him slipping into dementia. Yeah, um, and and uh, this is the one entry that isn't directed by Coscarelli; is yeah. directed by David Hartman, and it shows. Um. And I would be, I'm curious, I'm going to hold off uh, and not opine right away, but I'm curious to hear what other people's thoughts on Ravager are, because I can't help myself, because I liked it better this time than uh -huh. when I saw it the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, we have a mutual friend, Dr. AC, uh, and we both kind of huddled after we saw it. Uh, it came out and we did the same thing. We watched at the same time, essentially, just in two different time zones. And he's like, what did you think? And I said, you know, I saw the beginning of that when they had the remaster of Phantasm playing right. and Coscarelli showed up and they showed five minutes of it. It was that whole day, a Roebuck sequence that makes no fucking sense. <laughs> and I was going, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. But we both said the same thing. This feels like a good, solid end to mm -hmm. this story. It cuts away a lot of the things that drove me crazy in the, the middle movies. It goes back to the idea of, you know, it's it's that Reaper in the Seventh Seal. He gets off the beach and he goes to Morningside Cemetery and he's just death. And it's waiting for all of us. The Ravager is time. And so I really, I, I finally felt they were getting back into the nonlinear time. Mm. I, I felt that there was a, the surreality came up and there was so much weird heart. I don't know if he could have done anything else because everybody's so fucking old. You yeah, know, you're, yeah. you look at it and you know, the, 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 not decrepit, but the, the, the fragility of Reggie Bannister in that yeah. film is obvious. And it really hit me watching the movie in the very beginning. I'm like, this is going to be the biggest steaming piece of shit ever. I'm what, I mean, even the first uh, special effects plate, there's like dust 
on the plate. So uh, the car is moving and the ball's moving. And there's a piece of dust going back and forth. And I'm like, going, I can't believe how ramshackle this is. And then he's in a wheelchair. Yep. And at that moment, it's like smelling salts. I'm like, whoa, where are we? I was going, this is great. This is Don once again doing something unexpected. Uh, it was like he grabbed Phantasm back. And I mean, it, it's only his writing, right? It's not right. directed by him. But there's something about the way that that's put together and the way that it ends is so weirdly heartfelt. If yeah. that could be my end, I'd be happy. My friends, I'd die with my friends. Yeah. And we go on an adventure like Valhalla. Exactly. Fuck. Exactly. Uh, Eric, how about you? I loved Phantasm 4 so much that I was, I think, had my expectations too high for this one. And I actually enjoyed most of Ravager. I didn't feel like it stuck the ending for me as well. And I, at, after reading John's book, I realized, you know, it, Coscarelli's point was it never ends. Mm. But mm -hmm. my point was it never ends, but it could have never ended a little better. <laughs> 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 it, it just... Uh, one of the most ambiguous endings ever. So I guess it continues the ambiguity. I, I guess I shouldn't complain because that's one of my favorite things about the whole the whole uh, series. I did not like the CGI spheres. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They set my teeth on edge. Yep, that's yeah, that's that's understandable. Uh, John, how about you? What what are your feelings on Ravager? Uh, it was interesting that uh, Scott used the word heartfelt because that's that's the one that, that uh, jumps to mind for me. I loved the fact that they they addressed you know the, the oncoming decrepitude um, and and actually actually talked about dementia in it and 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 wove that into the plot. Um, you know, it was it wasn't just okay? We're going to going to age the characters. Like it, it actually became an integral part of the plot. Not not everything not everything about it worked perfectly, but on balance, I think I, I'm I'm just really glad they worked that in. Well, speaking of heartfelt, Reggie's death scene, I I thought I was I was kind of keeping my fingers crossed because I could see it coming and thinking, please don't try to milk this too hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, they, and they didn't. Like it could have been that could have been so but clenchingly cheesy. Yeah. Um, and, and fair enough, they, you know, they do have, you know, Mike and Jody holding his hands and whatnot that, that could have been milked for sentimentality to a, mm -hmm. to just a really horrible degree. And they didn't. And I, and, and I, I really applaud that. It wasn't so much the, the, uh, the spheres that bothered me. It was the, uh, the cityscape and everything that just looked like, mm -hmm. a, like an 80. Uh, yeah. Um, I really could have lived with that. And I think they, they could have found a way around that. There, there were ways you could have put that across. It wouldn't have necessarily cost any more because, because God knows this was this was done on the cheap. I can't yeah, remember yeah. what what and in secret was. too. That's the other thing. Like yeah, this, nobody secret. nobody knew this movie was even happening until it happened. Yeah, exactly. As a friend of mine is uh, is 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 want to point out uh, at, at somebody at, at at some point only two people knew that the American president had gotten a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, you know, nobody can keep a secret anymore at all. And, and, and the fact that, that, you know, I was, I was well into working on this book with Don before. And, and, you know, I, I heard some rumors, but it, it wasn't until like we were, we were probably about at the halfway point of getting this done when he dropped it on me that, Oh, this thing is basically in the can. Yeah. And, uh, and he showed, he, he showed me a, an early version. There were, there were a few, a few edits were different from the final version, but he showed it to me, and he and he and he told me afterwards what you know, sort of what was what was going to be changed. And I was like, "That's it! Like that's that's <laughs> all that's left to do in this film, and it's been you've been sitting on it all this time." And he said, "Well, you know, that's what happens when you have you have this thing made with a total of like thirty yeah. people, and uh, but even even that is is remarkable. Like, yeah, sure, it's indie, sure, it's low budget, but." How do you keep a lid on a thing like that? Yeah, it, it's it's phantasm as well, exactly. Having come off of part four and admiring it but not loving it, and then seeing that Ravager, when it starts, I'm like, whoa, this is add up everything in the first few scenes. It costs seventeen dollars and thirty two cents. <laughs> and I was like, ugh. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? Adjusted for inflation, so did Phantasm one. So then I was like, okay, let me sit with this a little bit, and then. While it went wackadoodle, and yeah, there's some there's some effects moments like yes, with the city that was giving me big Uva Bowl vibes or like <laughs> Blood Rain sequels. <laughs> when I work 
with some of my clients on interpreting their dreams in my therapy sessions. I brought up before uh, how sometimes we look at just, you know, what's, what's iconography that's, that's, that's interesting. What does this symbolize? One framework that I love to work with is, okay, what if in this dream, every single person that you encounter, they're all different versions of you. Mm-hmm. What if this is all you? So it's not that you're thinking of, oh, I'm dealing with this big theme of, uh, you know, I, of anxiety at work. No, no, no. It's the part of you talking to yourself that's hard on yourself. How do you do that? Mm. And thinking of Ravager that way, I love it. It makes sense it, it, oh, as much as it does <laughs> the entire <laughs> franchise. Okay, you know what? You have uh, you have Michael who starts out being a, uh, uh, a scared kid and then becomes a little bit more of the hero and then becomes a ball and then has no just has a ball in him and then no he is a, like the evolution of that and the fact that that is just an aspect of reggie because reggie has been the main character all along if you take it through this through this mm-hmm. perspective then it just makes sense i was like it, it, as much as dreams do and i love that each of these characters then can be reggie reconciling with his entire past much like a citizen kane moment <laughs> but yeah. with flying balls instead of spheres uh and i love the notion that at the end it does keep going or does it when the dreamer wakes up, does the dream continue? And how much is that just like art? We create mm. something and after it's created, does it sit there? No, it lives on. It lives on and sometimes people can pick it up and run with it later on down the line. Yep. Rocky can show up and have her own little spin at the end. Mm-hmm. I ended up liking it much more uh, th- than, I, than I thought I would. I was very, very surprised. Matthew, you just made this movie better for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have I've a good time again. I've, I've always thought it'd be, it'd be interesting to get to get uh, like a, an actual psychological professional's view on a lot of this thing. And, and the mm-hmm. problem is, uh, I've, I've known I've known lots of people in in uh, in that profession in my lifetime, but but uh, next to none of them have been horror nerds. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's really refreshing to finally be able to hear something of this. During my classwork, when we were talking about group therapy and all the things that you should and should not do. My entire classwork, I was like, wait, so Nancy Thompson was wrong. <laughs> don't, do <this. laughs> don't sit there with everybody <laughs> uh, i'm, I'm I, so happy to be on this panel go ahead AC. but I, I saw i saw three four and five together like a, in a run you know i watched them wow. as a, a triple feature i liked all three of them more than i liked them the first time i saw them mm-hmm. and i think that is so true of so many movies and horror movies that, that you stop uh, watching it for the movie that it isn't or that you want it to be, and instead it becomes the movie that it is. Part of that is the fact that I just finished reading Don Coscarelli's autobiography, mm-hmm. yeah. True yeah. Indie, and yeah. so you you get that compassion for him making these movies and knowing the struggles that it took, knowing that in some ways he's a little Romero in that regard, and that like this is the movie he could make, Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. it's not necessarily the movie he was dying to make, but it, it's the movie that they would give him some money to make. And so I will make another Phantasm movie in the way that Romero would consistently have to do another dead movie. Yeah, right. Dead Reckoning is kind of his dead reckoning. So one of the things that uh, came to my mind, I, I had mentioned it before, and it's, I was being a little silly, but maybe not, was Seventh Seal. Mm. One of the things that I, I see a comparison between these two, uh, the franchise and Seventh Seal, which is, you know, they meet death and uh, the knight is there and he's going to play chess with them. And the thing is, in the end, death still gets exactly what it wants. It's basically this weird compassion of letting the, the knight feel that he's getting somewhere by doing this, this, uh, this <laughs> struggle. Yep. And so it's like the tall man always to me was, you play a good game, boy, but the game is over. And now you die. Yeah. And there's this weird, compa- there's a fear of death. That is the, the bulk of the the series and then there's the realization at the end the acceptance of going in the hut that happens in the seventh seal so there's this whole feeling to me that there's the, there's this uh don't fear the reaper kind of deal yeah, that's yeah. going on yeah. with with uh, the tall man and in the end there's like this weird strange compassion to it continuing on in the way that people were talking about it 
And, you know, the acting, I really love the scenes with Michael Baldwin and uh, Reggie Bannister when they're talking in the yard of the hospital and everything. Yeah, right. There's yeah. so much compassion going on from what we saw Michael to be before, what we saw with Reggie. And my dad's going through dementia. So the whole idea of like, oh, great, I'm safe. Where am I safe? It, yeah. it was a really interesting way for him to talk and getting into it. That acting really works for the, the somberness that there is in this part. And someone had mentioned how this movie was kept a secret. I got to see Coscarelli in at Folsom, California, for a really shitty convention where they had this big arena and they had nobody there. So he's sitting there alone most of the time. And I went <laughs> up to him and just started hitting on him, I guess, in that way <laughs> that fans do. And uh, he, uh, we had a great conversation because I mentioned the European stuff. Yeah, and I, I mentioned, no, that Don't Look Now is a big movie for me. And he's like, going, oh, well, that's the thing. Nicholas Rogue with the idea of the editing that's not linear. And, and so he went on this, this conversation. He said, keep coming back whenever you want when there's not a lot of people here. Yeah. And he never let on what was going on. But he and now, <laughs> now I get when he's like, going, I don't know, maybe they'd let me make another one if I don't direct it. <laughs> you know, he's saying shit like that. And I'm like, going, oh, Come on, Don. <laughs> Who would have that happen? And so he was just keeping it to his vest, but he still felt the need to be a little coy about it. He brought That's, up a couple yeah. things that ended up in the movie uh, five. What was it, five years later? It's like a, unbelievable. But yeah, uh, in the long run, it's still such an important part of my uh, experience as a horror fan. Uh, it yeah. definitely made me fall in love with storytelling of a certain type. It made me not want to just go with slashers. Yeah. I needed to have something more. Right. And that's what, uh, his movies always made me feel as if he was trying to attain more. Something you just said, Scott, though, like when you, when you read Angus Scrim's line and like, I saw it for the first time, like as though it was printed on a page, it's such a beautiful epitaph yeah. if you'd say you played a good game boy but now the game is over now you die yeah. and it, and it's not you know when angus scrim of course performs it it's done with that kind of scary quality the the idea of like that just kind of being the overall theme of this movie mm -hmm. is that we all play a good game yeah and at some point the game is over and we die and that's okay like that, that there isn't that awfulness to death that it is just the inevitability of it that's all i gotta say yeah <laughs> it may be like what toby hooper said about uh like texas chainsaw it takes you 20 30 years to know what your movie's really about yeah yeah i honestly have never heard that line that way before and so i too am glad to be on this panel <laughs> so i could hear the tall man's line spoken with compassion because when we see angus scrim like one of the last times we see him, he's in that hospital bed as Jebediah Morningside. Yeah. And he's so, you talk about how frail Reggie Bannister mm. is, but like yeah. Angus Scrim is just hanging in there long enough to make this movie for his friend, Don. You can't ignore the meta factor. You know, he'd, he'd been in failing health, but he was just, he was so determined because he was such a fucking ham. That's the thing is he, right. He, <laughs> it's like, okay, I've got limited time left. I want to get my screen time. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, we're looking at, at Reggie and talking about dementia. And then, but you're, you're also looking at the guy who plays the tall man, this supposedly timeless yeah. mental yeah. being. Um, and, and yet knowing that, that, uh, that the actor is actually, uh, close to the end here, uh, there, there, there really, there was a, just such a weird resonance to that. Yeah. Yeah. The death, when death comes for the tall man as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It's a, it's a similar character or a similar archetype, but similar. I was thinking, um, uh, Poltergeist two with Kane, sure. uh, mm. that yes. actor being in really failing health and that really resonating with what was happening in the movie or, or, or the log lady on uh from the yeah show. yeah um, and harry dean stanton from the same from that's the right. Peak return aac you mentioned something interesting which was reading the book uh, i now true indies become one of those things that i read every year now and uh, i also got the audio book so i can listen to him oh, great. and if you hear him talk about the actors this is family 
This is yeah. this isn't like oh you know we worked together a couple times and damn I'm, I'm sorry we can't work anymore. He his voice starts to crack yeah. when it's time to say goodbye to Angus, and uh, I believe he went to see him. And so you you know you you feel that whole thing that from the very beginning Coscarelli he's worked with a couple dicks along the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the most part, the people that he kept coming back to were pretty much like family. And he worked his way. Uh, he made the story sometimes uh, fit what's going on with the people. I think it's really interesting to think about uh, a guy like him who, I mean, Jesus, if you read his book, how many brushes with greatness did this guy have by the yeah. time he was able to drink you know he wasn't even <laughs> drinking age and he was like playing with disney and everybody and yeah. and here he is instead of being you know uh, another version of uh of spielberg you've got this indie guy who is spending time telling everybody hey if you don't rent equipment rent a warehouse <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. put everything there and keep it for six months because you never know when you're gonna have to do reshoots it's like it's cheaper you know storage mm -hmm. is cheaper and, and he's telling you that stuff because he's still fighting in the trenches. Yeah. I really need to, to, to read that. I, I, I never did get around to reading it yet. But, uh, but also, I just from, from interviewing all of those people uh, in, in the process of doing the book, the affection they have for each other, like, like you were saying, it's, it's just, it was just so palpable with all of them. And also, like some of the crew people I talked to as well, they never experienced anything quite like that again. Um, working at, at, you know, in, no matter which level of the industry they were in. As we bring this to a close, I do recommend everybody, you know, do check out Don Coscarelli's book, True Indie. Check out John Bowen's book on the Phantasm series uh, through the Rue Morgue label. Uh, it's still it's still out there. I was just on Amazon today and it's like, yep, there it is. So yeah, you can also Don, bought, Don bought up the, the remaining copies uh, and they're they're available through his site now. Like you, you can't you can't actually get them through Rue Morgue anymore. Okay. Okay. But, so uh, yeah, so Don few, has few them. All right. Later. Yeah. He, Go to phantasm.com. <gasps> yeah, yeah. I think I can't remember what it's called now, but if you if you type phantasm.com, you get to where, wherever <laughs> he's at. So, yeah. I'm going down to LA next week to oh, sure. her, the, the the book that's coming out fiction p h i c t i o n tales from the world of phantasm and it's a hard book uh with a slip case uh the joe lansdale does the intro that was a fun little uh wrap up note uh thank you all so much this was a, a great great conversation well, good to meet you all. Well, in fact, Aaron and I never even met face to face or, or in real time until just a couple of nights. That's ago. right. That's right. Like, <laughs> like we're actually. That's part of the reason why I do this is that you know I just want to hang out with you guys. Yeah, so it's so a great thank, joy. Thanks for coming to my party. Sure. Yeah. Well, th thank you guys. Wonderful to meet you all. Until next time, keep searching, keep exploring, and keep sharing the scare.